What would the world be like without any teachers? Take some time to really reflect on that question. When you think about it, how vital, how essential are teachers to everything we do? More than we can realize. When you take the time to consider how we mold and shape the lives of children for years and years to come, you start to begin to see that the field of education and teachers are a fundamental and necessary cog in the wheel of what we call life. People just don't make it that far or actually accomplish much of anything in life without teachers. And I'm not just talking about your first teachers and your parents, but I'm talking about the teachers that make us who we are in terms of our reading abilities, our computation skills, our ability to think critically in the world. When you get some chance or you get some time, check out on YouTube. There's a video titled World Without Teachers. And hear what some of the young adults and teenagers and even elder adults have to say about the impacts teachers have made up on their lives. And ask yourself, what would the world be like without any teachers? Now, what is special education? It's a specially designed instruction for students to meet their individual needs and to be monitored closely. You know, special education provides different types of services, whether that be along the lines of speech and language therapy, physical therapy, and a variety of other services. You also have supplementary aid services, such as preferential seating in the classroom, or what type of access to certain types of technology you should have for the purpose of your communication, and even instructional adjustments. Two of my favorite vocabulary words for you to impress upon during this time when it comes to special education is accommodations and modifications. You see, accommodations change how students learn and modifications change what students learn. So let's put that in retrospect for you. If I'm going to change how you learn, it could be me shifting from providing you something in writing to providing it to you in auditory listening. And if I am to modify what you learn, it could be that instead of taking the time to teach you regrouping with math, we are still working on basic number sense understanding of what is one more and what is one less. The accommodations and modifications that develop and shape what special education is allows for people who are in the special education realm to really hone in on exactly what students need. So that is what special, special education is. Now it's time to get you caught up on some special education jargon. And you'll hear these words and letters and combinations of things strung together. And it's important that when you hear these things in education, you take the time to stop and ask people, what are you talking about? Because as educators, we become so captivated in them and using them in everyday language, we, we forget that people outside of the world of education have no idea what they are. And the first one is IDEA. Now, most of you look at it, they're like IDEA. No, it's the Individuals with Disabilities Act. And this is the describes that categories of disabilities that are served by the law and establishes procedures for identifying eligible students uh, for those uh, services. And the core principles of the uh, IDEA uh, also have some acronyms like FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education. And when we say free appropriate public education, let's keep in mind that everyone wants to have their child receive a glorious top-notch education. And sometimes that is not always possible when you have educators that range from a first-year teacher all the way up to a 25th-year veteran. 
There's no way in the world we're going to sit here and truly say that the quality of learning from that first year teacher and the quality of learning received from that 25th year teacher is going to be the same. It's going to be different. That 25th year teacher has a bevy of, of instructional resources and strategies they have grown to master over time, whereas that first year teacher is going to have some struggles early on. And so when we talk about free, appropriate public education, you got to remember it is what we are able and capable of providing in that moment at that time with what we have. Then we have the least restrictive uh, environment, the LRE. That is to ensure that whatever it is or what decisions we're making when it comes to education, that we are always keeping at the mind front that we are putting kids in the least restrictive environment possible, not setting up to be in a situation where they're on their own one by one on one, but trying to see, can you survive in a space with up to 25 students, 15 students, 10 students? Because realistically, can we give every student one on one attention every single day? We know we don't have enough teachers for that. And then, of course, IEP, which stands for Individualized Education Program. And that is the element in which, uh, or not pro a program, or it could be plan, but that is the element in which the special education teacher, along with the general education teacher, the administrator, and even sometimes a process coordinator have sat down to determine what is going to be the best plan of action, of course, for this kid that is now qualified for services. And then, of course, some other things that fall under the core principles of IDEA is non-discriminatory evaluations, Due process in the situations in which um, you are needing to be heard or revisit something that is uh, out of line or does not comply with what has been established for your plan uh, related to your services. And then, of course, uh, zero reject or child find, the element in which we owe a duty to our patrons, our students, our community to make sure we are not just waiting for someone to request to be uh, receiving these services, but that we are actually following a systematic process and being able to possibly identify these students ahead of time so we can get the proper interventions necessary set up for their success. Now ask yourself this question, what influences have shaped special education? And if you haven't been around quite a while or understand the depths of special education, you have no idea what could have possibly shaped it. But there are such great links through social and political context that have shaped how special education is perceived or what it's supposed to do. Parent advocacy has had played a role in how you can accomplish and what you can do within it. The civil rights movement and current civil rights legislation have played a tremendous role in it. And then you have the precedent setting court cases, you know, and I'll talk about one here very soon briefly. And current general education legislation that are sometimes dictated and determined by maybe whoever the latest uh, leader in uh, education is and the decisions that they make that govern education. But I want to start with the fact that in the history of education, uh, let's go to the early 1900s, you, you, you had this general education that was set up for students with just, you know, mild disabilities, nothing super severe, right? That was where you could thrive and you could succeed. And if you had anything beyond that, then this education really wasn't for you. And then we fast forward to the 1950s where there were some segregated classes, classrooms for students with disabilities. And so if you were uniquely different, then, hey, we were putting you somewhere completely off to the side and, and, saying that you couldn't be with the rest of the students. And uh, typically, you know, with these segregated classrooms, we ended up having a lot of undesirable outcomes and uh, students weren't learning in these uh, separate spaces as much as the general education students were learning. And so that's where your uprising of organizations like or these parent advocacy groups were, were coming up. And so you had like uh, United Cerebral Palsy for students who were suffering from that. You had the Association for Retarded Children that popped up in around uh, the 1950s as well. And you had the National Association for Down Syndrome, which took place in roughly in the 1960 range. But they opposed 
the institutionalization of students with significant disabilities and force public education to attend to the needs of those students in the public education space. And they lobbied for increased research so that teachers and uh, administrators and uh, district leaders would have the wherewithal and the knowledge to be able to set people up uh, for success. Now consider these questions. What could have possibly happened in these classrooms back in the 1900s, early 1900s, to make us feel like special education was necessary? Now think about this question. What awful things would you need to see to feel like something drastic had to be done? That's what parents were facing. That's what they were looking at. That's what they were taking into consideration. And so naturally, what any parent would want is an opportunity for their child to have everything else everyone else has, regardless of how they were born and what they were born with. So now I'll lead us to some of the civil rights movement things that, you know, really changed the game. And I'm gonna start with 1954's Brown versus Board of Education, which ruling that separate education for African American African Americans was not equal. And it ensured that diverse student groups learn together. And it also influenced thinking about individuals with disabilities. It recognized violations of rights of students with disabilities and the effects of precedent setting court cases can have for potential principles of uh, key things that I just talked about, like IDEA. And then the support services provided in general education that we see today and the basis for compensatory and punitive damages uh, that could be paid out to families if these things were neglected. Now I'm going to give you one professor's opinion. Being that I am of Black or African American uh, descent and understanding the role in which Brown versus Board of Education had on education, I always posit for my students to think about this. We were talking about putting all these kids together to learn and receive equal education. But when we fought for separate but equal or, or, or got away from that Plessy versus Ferguson to get to the Brown versus the Board of Education where everyone could get the same opportunity for education, what we didn't fight for and what got lost in that was that there was no integration of educators. There was no in integration of leaders. It was just children integrating into these schools and all these spaces where the educators were predominantly white. I'm sure during that time period, people of color who were in education as teachers and even principals would have loved an opportunity to immerse themselves into better buildings, have better resources to teach students with, and even have an opportunity to showcase that they could utilize their skill set to have an impact on more than just black students. But that opportunity was not given to the adults. It was given to the children. And the children were then being expected to be taught by women who weren't black how to reach, connect, and teach these students of color how to understand themselves, their sense of self-worth, their value, and what was actually truly possible for them. And now you see the detrimental effects that education is in when you think about individuals like myself that only make up less than 2% of the field. And we have been climbing our way back since the 1950s to get to the element of where someone like myself could be here at a collegiate university teaching a collegiate course leading an elementary school building and having taught several years in elementary schools and in high schools for the betterment of students of all races and all colors and all ethnicities. So this is one professor's opinion that even though we had a ruling in 1954 that changed the dynamic, here we are roughly, what, 80 Let's see, 90, 90, 50, one, 
Whew, oh my goodness, here we are, roughly some 70 years later. And we are still trying to climb back and put ourselves in a position to achieve the ultimate goal that separate education for African Americans or anyone is not equal. But in that same retrospect, that everyone can have the same opportunity to grow, learn, and succeed at the rate as anyone anywhere in the country. Now, I'm doing my best not to spend too much time on any one of these particular topics, because as you continue to read the text, uh, Psychology of the Exceptional Student, you're going to get deeper dives with each chapter that comes by. And so I'm really just trying to touch the surface with everything here. And right here, you see an image of a triangle uh, depicted with a very hefty lower green bottle and a mid-size yellow region and a red small top. And what that is reflective of is the multi-tier support system that exists within education that we break into three tiers. Tier one, which is the universal, where we're trying to capture at least anywhere from 80 to 90% of students with what we just do for all kids. And that should be good enough to reach 80 to 90% of the kids. And if that's not reaching 80 to 90% of the kids, that is up to us as educators and the people that are leading to take a look at our practices to ensure that they are reaching that particular amount of kids. And, and per building to building, it could look completely different on what you have to do at the tier one level. Now, even though we talk about that being universal, what's universal in my building may not be what's universal in your building or the building across town or the building in another state on the other side of the country. You have to determine what that tier one universal practice is going to look like when it comes to instruction for your students based off of their socioeconomic stack status, background information that they obtain, the schema, and their behavior. What type of things and systems or processes are necessary to make sure that they understand the flow of coming into the school and meeting common behavior expectations? Now, I shift us up to that tier two where we are trying to talk about a targeted group that makes up only five to 10 percent of your school's population, where you are taking the time to target the intervention and reteach and give just a little bit more for those particular students. And if you are thinking about a school building right now where there are just a bevy of individuals needing way more than you understand for to be targeted, then I almost say, hey, you need to revisit your tier one practices so that you are not working that hard. And that brings me to tier three, which is an intensive. And when it because it's intensive, you should only be striving for about one to five percent of the population being in this area. And if you have way more than that. Then once again, I'm talking about your tier one practices needing to be really ramped up so that way you don't find yourself having such a significant population of students, whether that be academically, behaviorally, emotionally or attendance, having to receive intensive interventions at that level. And so when you think about the grand scheme of education and what we're trying to accomplish, this is beyond more than what you just teach from your textbooks or what you get from a strategy. It is about connecting and understanding the whole child and the response to intervention and multi-tier support systems are set up to help you be successful. There is some more education jargon for you. So response to intervention, you'll typically see with the RTI model or those initials RTI and then multi-tier support system, you'll see MTSS. So add those to your list. And then when it comes to behavior, you'll often hear people talk about beha positive behavior supports because we know that the best way to make progress with our students is through positive feedback, positive intervention and proactiveness. If we are always just reactive, thinking about consequences and negative, uh, negative outpourings of words and behavior that we push upon, all we're teaching is for those students to learn negative processes and push out negativity into the environment. And we all know we strive to be in a positive educational environment. And so that starts from the top down of the leaders to the teachers and enforcing that into the kids and then making sure that the families understand that model as well. One of my favorite things to talk about in education is expectations. 
high expectations. What does that look like? And what do we mean when we say that? Is that very clear to people? Do they truly understand what we're looking for or what we're trying to obtain? Oftentimes, no. They have no idea what we're talking about, what we're trying to obtain. But in order to get high expectations, I always talk about that word accountability. And my question that I pose to people is, do we really want to be held accountable? Do we? I mean, we talk about accountability, but when it's time to be held accountable for what we're doing, how oftentimes are we being resistive or we feel like someone's under attack and attacking our character and our very essence of who we are? That's common. And what I tell people is we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I know those two things work against one another so much, but you have got to establish a sense of understanding that you're going to be uncomfortable at times through this profession. And you can't let the uncomfortableness scare you away or cause you to do nothing. So to truly be accountable for oneself, you have got to seek out accountability partners. People you trust to be vulnerable with you and tell you when you're wrong and build you up and give you the knowledge and the insight you need when you fall short. So I challenge you, if you're going to walk forward with this accountability and high expectations concept, make sure that everyone has the ability to do this for you, no matter what their circumstances are. Hold yourself above no one. Be humble, have humility, and bring yourself down to be amongst the common everyday people you are working alongside, never inflating yourself with too much pride to be above them. What I love about education is that it is such an evidence-based practice. Everyone has the opportunity through their career to hone in on skills, to improve from year to year the outlook and the trajectory of students. But we only do that when we use high quality research studies based on evidence. We use interventions, policies, that demonstrate effectiveness grounded in research. And we've also got to be mindful to eliminate the use of practices that are based on tradition, teacher preference, familiarity, and yes, even popularity. If those elements aren't producing exactly what it is that we need to have high expectations and high success rates, then we got to do away with it. We have got to do away with doing these lessons that don't align to what we are truly trying to capture and do for students on a day-to-day basis. We oftentimes try to take advantage of things within our normal everyday surroundings, whether that be holidays. Yes, it's okay to take some time to pinpoint those things or make those things prevalent to students and put it in front of their face and connect to it. But If it's not going to help them on that assessment that you need to give or by that end of the year goal target that you are required to teach by state laws, then you're doing yourself and those students a disservice. So, yes, it's fun to do a lot of different things. It's fun to hop on what's popular. But if it's not yielding results, you've got to reflect as the practitioner and say, am I truly doing and making decisions that are best or what's in the best interest of kids. I wanted to spend some time briefly touching on the 13 categories of disabilities in federal law. And for your individual researches, most of your stuff would fall under these categories or could fall under these categories. But I wanted to give you a quick little breakdown from our textbook about the percentages of students being serviced in these areas. Learning disability, making up 39.2%, is the most common disability. This is for students who have difficulty processing information such as reading, writing, and computing. Then we have speech language impairments that make up 17.6%. This is for students with difficulty receiving or producing language. So we're talking about articulation and fluency, their speaking rate, their ability to use their mouth to produce fricatives and using different parts of the mouth like the glottis or the 
top of the tongue, uh, roof of your mouth, your teeth and uh, your teeth touching to produce sounds and a voice vibrating, an unvoiced sound or a voiced sound, all those different things. It's an incredible thing. I love speech language. Then you have intellectual disabilities that make up 7%, which is a range of severe disabilities. It can be significant limitations in intellectual ability and also even adaptive behavior. And then we have emotional disturbance, which makes up about 5.9%. This is for students with difficulty with interpersonal relationships or even inappropriate emotional responses. The autism spectrum disorder seems to be increasing, right? But not every student who has autism is in special education services. So um, as of when this book was published, 8.6% uh, was the makeup. And it's curious to see across the world as more and more students are being diagnosed, are we automatically just putting students on individualized education plans because they have autism? Or are we allowing for them to thrive still in the general edu education space? But students with autism can range from high intelligence uh, to intellectual disabilities, and they could even just have issues with difficulty in social responsiveness and re may require routine. And we are seeing this change the game in how different schools are popping up to provide services for students in different categories to ensure that they can have a space in which they don't feel any different or understand that uh, they, that they're not outside looking in. They're human. Then we have hearing impairment, which makes up 1.1%. Now that's either partial or complete hearing loss. We have visual impairment, which makes up 0.4%. And that's for people who have partial or complete uh, visual loss. We have deaf and blindness, which is less than 0.05%, uh, which of uh, people that have significant hearing and uh, vision loss. So it's very uncommon to see those two things together. Then you have orthopedic impairment, which makes up 0.8%. These are impairments caused by movement or motor activities. Uh, then we have traumatic brain injuries that make up 0.4% of services. Uh, this could be serious brain injury from some type of accident or injury. And then there's the category of other health impairment, which makes up about 14.4% of students receiving services. And that could be anywhere from somebody having cancer, um, attention deficit disorder or attention deficit hyperactive disorder, even diabetes falls in that category, or any disease or health disorder that negatively affects a student's learning. And then you have students with multiple disabilities that make up 2.1%, meaning that they have two or more disabilities. And then there's developmental delay that makes up 2.4%. And this is a non-specific disability, but it may apply up to age nine. And most times we see those in those young child, young developmental delays uh, in early childhood settings. In this course, I also have people ask me, what about those students who fall outside of the category of disabilities? They're just on the other side, like they're overachieving or let's go ahead and say it, gifted, talented. Now students who demonstrate the ability to be far above average in one or several areas. They have the ability to have great leadership or academic success in various subjects, creativity, visual, performing arts, you name it. This isn't necessarily addressed in federal special education law, but there are laws in some states that provide guidelines for identifying and educating these gifted and talented students. But there are varied levels of support for these students among states and among districts within states. It's really tough sometimes to define a line and what's going to be considered gifted or talented and what's considered just a high achieving and hardworking student. Uh, because nobody wants to be told that they're not talented or they're not gifted. But then we also have people that have certain exceptionalities that allow for them to capture and information or detect patterns and schemes at a rate in which most other students' brains aren't able to. And it's okay to allow those savant-like 
individuals to flourish in certain spaces. Uh, but also understand that there's going to be areas where they probably don't thrive as well. And so they're going to still need the same intentional, direct instruction as any other student in those spaces, too. And so just not overlooking just because a student is talented or gifted that they don't need you. They still need you as an educator. And you shouldn't feel intimidated if you have one in your classroom. If anything, you should see it as a true, unique learning opportunity about the richness and what the mind is capable of when it's truly inspired and has something in which it fixates on to be great at. Another area we'll touch base on in this course is the Section 504. And this is to help level the playing field for students who have certain health diagnoses that make it hard for them to have the same access to education as other students without that particular health impairment. And so in these situations, you'll see individuals with like ADHD, um, some type of other medical condition, like um, sickle cell, yeah, sickle cell, or some other types of things like diabetes, the goal is to make sure that if they are missing some class time related to those issues, that that's not being held against them. Or if it's impeding their, on their ability to <clears throat> do something in the same rate in which somebody else in class would do, uh, that they not be held to a standard that they should do it in spite of the health impairment. And so what typically happens is, is there are some disability scales that are sent out uh, for teachers to take a look at and ask if this kid can do a certain task as good or as better or worse than a average peer. And so you gather as many of these as you can together to determine what it is this student's plan is going to look like and what type of supports we're going to provide. And keep in mind with the Section 504, because we're talking about things like Crohn's disease or spina bifida or dwarfism, even, you know, some type of medical condition, we're talking about not necessarily what we're going to do for them academically, but how we're going to give them access to things that most students that wouldn't typically have access to on a regular basis. And that could be anything from uh, extra time to complete work, to access to the bathroom and the nurse at a rate in which most other students wouldn't typically have, or even just the opportunity to have preferential seating near the teacher because of that particular medical condition. That's what Section 504 typically aims to cover. And what we've seen in this field now is that people use it like a consolation prize if they don't get an individualized education plan. That's not what a Section 504 is for. Is it possible to have a student that's on both an IEP and a Section 504? That is possible, especially if the 504 predates the individualized education plan. But it's possible that the 504 could drop off if those things get weaved into the individualized education plan and uh, get picked up by the case provider uh, for the special education plan. So it's different. It's unique to every circumstance. Every district has a different way in which they go about it. Every state has a different way in which they go about it. But we'll spend some time diving into this more as well. And lastly, I want to talk about a area in that I throw into the realm of students with exceptionalities or disabilities, you name it, but the category of what the field likes to call students who are at risk. Now, I, I really don't care for this term. So I say students who are at, at, at opportunity, who are at purpose, um, students whose characteristics and environments or experiences make them less likely to succeed at school, but I show those kids and I work with teachers and I work with families to show them that the environment, those characteristics, their experiences don't set them up for failure. In fact, it makes them resilient. It makes them tough. It makes them well-traveled. It makes them well-versed. It makes them have a common sense of understanding to be a critical thinker in rough, tough situations that most other people that don't go through hardships are capable of doing. These students could also be individuals whose primary language isn't English. 
and to say that they can't succeed or do well because they're learning English as their second language, they're still at opportunity. This could also be students who uh, educational progress is below average or uh, maybe have no disability or, or likely benefiting from those services I mentioned about response to intervention or MTSS. And it could be students who are homeless and living in poverty, needing to utilize the McKinney-Vento rule in the state of Missouri to get from one place to the next for school and home because uh, they've been displaced from the home. And so I just really don't believe in the concept of labeling, labeling these children in a way in which it's going to be a deficit for them, but how it's going to create opportunity for them. And if you can shape your mind around the opportunity that can be presented for these students and create ways in which you can push out some self-fulfilling prophecies for good, because with the labels, we've been also, we've been often generating self-fulfilling prophecies for negative, telling them that they'll work nowhere different than a department store, or that would be the best that they could do is be a manager at a local uh, small mom and pop shop, or uh, telling them that, you know, just the everyday hustle of being a worker at Home Depot or Lowe's is less. Oh, like there's still opportunity in that. You can work your way up that system. You can become the general manager. It just comes with effort and, and dedication and understanding what it is that you want out of life. We can't keep bringing up circumstances for these students and showing them that working odd jobs or staying at home is all they're bound for. But showing them that there's success in everything that we do and helping them understand what matters most. And more times than not, that's just your family, your loved ones, your friends, the people that love and care and wrap around you most. That's what it boils down to. That's what the connection is. We need them to see themselves and other peoples in their surroundings that are succeeding, not just the people that they see that are failing. And it takes a conscientious effort of educators like ourselves to keep putting those people in front of those students so that they know it's possible, that they are at opportunity, they are at purpose. That concludes today's lecture. May you have received everything that you needed to help in inspire you into the next upcoming assignments. And until we get together next time for our next presentation, this is Professor Evans signing off. <laughs>